good morning, friends. Happy Mother's Day. Please stand and let's worship together.
who could carry sin upon his shoulders, who endured the cross and scorned its shame, who was laid to rest like every other, but who rose again and stormed out of the grave. Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. Your word will never change. Your name is here to stay. Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. You are the one true King, Lord over everything. Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. Your word will never change. Your name is here to stay. Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. The mighty light of Judah, the pure and spotless lamb, the Alpha and Omega, the good and great I am, the God that saves the nations, the one we bow before. Let every voice sing out Who is like, who is like the Lord Oh, who is like the
temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense. Let's pray together. Father, every moment of every day we need you. And when we can't stand, when the burdens and the sufferings and the sorrows of this world are too much for us to carry, may we fall into your open arms. May we remember that your hands are always open, waiting to catch us. May we remember that we can't do anything apart from you. We can't draw the next breath. Our heart won't beat its next beat apart from you. We can't do what you command apart from you. And so it is true, Lord, that we need you. So come to us now meet our needs by the help and the power of your spirit. We pray and ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Horizons Church, and happy Mother's Day. Would you greet your neighbor before you find your seat? Once again, let me say to all the mothers in the room, happy Mother's Day. And if anyone ever gives you a hard time about, yeah, look, Michael's clapping. You, when, the mothers deserve a little more than a hand clap. I'm going to tell you what. I just, uh, if anyone ever gives you a hard time or you doubt the importance of your role, never forget, ladies, you are the kind of people that people come from. Okay? So you just tuck that away for next time. All right? What? It's true. It's just biology, okay? I know that's a rare thing in 2023, okay? But we speak the truth here at Horizons Church. <laughs> Forget birthing people day. It's Mother's Day for crying in a bucket. Anyway, okay. Well, if we haven't met yet, I am Josiah Pitts. I am the czar of truth-telling at Horizons Church. Now, I'm the campus pastor here at Lost Creek. So glad that you're here worshiping with us. Especially if you happen to be new, we've not yet had the opportunity to meet. Pastor Lucas is delivering the message today, and when he's done preaching, he'd love to meet you over at our welcome area, where that sign just lit up to the left, to give you a gift and tell you a little bit more about the church if you're new, all right? And uh, over to our right is our prayer room. I think Kathy Simons is supposed to be in there praying for us today. So if you have a need, you can feel free to utilize that room at any time. But we're cutting the rest of the announcements short because it is Mother's Day and we are dedicating many children today, which is awesome. So, yes, at this time, we're going to have come up to the platform the Ashburns, the Comptons, uh, Kim, Jackson, we're going to have the Jenkins, uh, the Money Pennies, and the Todds. If you all could come up to the platform with your children at this time, we will dedicate them. And uh, 
As they're coming up, let me read a passage of Scripture from Luke chapter 18, verses 15 to 17, which says, Now the people were bringing even infants to Jesus, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So, uh, just as a reminder, um, the disciples, I think, were a little annoyed that they thought that Jesus had a better way to spend his time than, you know, blessing and touching little babies and children. Uh, But... You get the idea. They were annoyed with these people, and Jesus was annoyed with the disciples for being annoyed because he loved children. He loves children, and he says, for, uh, as such to them belongs the kingdom of God. And so we are here to witness the dedication of these children today. So we are also going to witness the promises made by these parents to cultivate a Christian home where Christ will be honored and the word of God will be obeyed. And holy smokes, geez, I didn't turn around to see what was going on. I was like, what's with all the commotion back here? And you know what's really embarrassing is I forgot the anointing oil. So hold on, I have to disappear for a minute. I'm going to go, go behind stage here real quick. Look, I disappear behind the curtain. I come back. I've got the anointing oil. Woo! Man. See, if a mother was running this show, that would have been set out and ready. Where's the anointing oil? I don't know. You're looking right at it. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, here we are, guys. All right. <clears throat> recognizing the dignity and responsibility of parenthood and recognizing your dependence upon God for the strength and wisdom to faithfully parent your children, who are you presenting to the Lord today? We'll start with you guys. Haven. Haven. Wonderful. Sarah, Sarah, and Asa. Wonderful. Michael, Paisley, and Levi Crawford. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Perfect. All right. In the presence of these witnesses, do you solemnly promise to train your child by precept and by example to love God, to love your family, and to love others through faith in Christ? If so, answer, we do. And do you consecrate yourselves to helping your children become followers of Christ and to helping them access the resources of this church so that they can grow in their faith? If so, answer, we do. All right, Horizons Church, hearing the commitments of these parents, do you solemnly promise to assist them in raising and nurturing their children in a Christian lifestyle and in helping them discover Christ as their Savior? If so, answer, we will. Wonderful. Now, having heard these vows and assurances, we're going to entrust your children to the care and keeping of the Lord until the day that they come to believe in their hearts and confess with their mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
just do your heart good to hear the sounds of all those little kids. I love it. I love it. All right, would you uh, now extend your hands with me in blessing as I pray for all these children? Father, we thank you so much for the families here. We thank you for these children. We do ask that you would bless and keep these parents, help them to raise their children with wisdom and faith and love so that they may grow up to know you and love you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you all so much and very well done. All right. Well, that takes care of it for us for now. We have a couple brief videos, and then Pastor Lucas will be up to deliver the message. Today is a beautiful day of celebration, a day to honor the women who've shaped us, nurtured us, and walked us through life. It's a day to say thanks to all the moms Moms with toddlers tearing through the house, and moms whose babies have moved away. Moms who are doing this all by themselves, and moms who loved a child in need. Moms who have suffered unimaginable loss, and moms whose children are moms themselves. For all the times your love made things better, and the moments your wisdom made things clear, for the way you lived is an example, so we could see Jesus through you. For each and every memory that has lit the path we walk, we say thank you. Whether this is a day of celebration, reflection, or heartache, know that you are loved. Happy Mother's Day. We are about to listen to a message taught from God's Word. This is one of the most important parts of our gathering. Therefore, we ask you to silence your cell phone, not engage in conversation, and not allow your child to cause a distraction. If your little one does create a distraction, we kindly ask you to respect those around you by taking your child to our clean, safe nursery, using our family viewing area in the cafe, or one of our cry rooms located behind you, where you can see and hear everything and your child will appreciate the extra freedom. For young seminary student Edward Spencer, September 7th, 1860 was just another Friday for him. And as that day drew to a close, he was closing up the books that he had been studying and putting them away and getting ready to head off to bed. Because this Friday night was just like all the rest as far as he was concerned. So he laid down in his bed and he drifted off to sleep thinking about what the Saturday to follow might hold for him in the little town of Evanston, Illinois. Now, 14 miles south in Chicago, a steamboat by the name of the Lady Elgin was getting ready to leave the docks and head up the coast of Lake Michigan towards Milwaukee. Now, this was a route that Captain Jack Wilson and the Elgin had made time and time again. So when the nearly 400 passengers aboard the Elgin left the docks about 11 p.m. Friday night, they were looking forward to a nice, pleasant cruise up the coast back home towards Milwaukee. Now, the first three hours of their journey went pretty much as expected. The ride was a little bumpy because there was a storm that was stirring up the water, but nothing out of the ordinary. But just after 2 o'clock in the morning, a small schooner appeared out of the thick fog, and that schooner was carrying a load of lumber and headed towards Chicago and towards the Lady Elgin. This should have been an absolutely classic case in every sense of two ships just passing in the night. But the problem was the schooner wasn't on a course to just pass the Elgin by. It was on a collision course. And because of the thick fog and a less than stellar job being done by the watchman on duty, by the times the two ships recognized one another, recognized the course they were on, it was too late. And so just a few minutes after that schooner was spotted, it slammed head on into the side of the Elgin and gashed the side of the boat open. Now, fortunately for the schooner, it was able to limp the last few miles to Chicago safely with everyone aboard arriving without any issues. But the damage to the Elgin was a bit more severe. And by the time that schooner reached Chicago, 
Captain Wilson and the rest of the crew and the members who were aboard the Elgin were now in the water in Lake Michigan trying desperately to survive. And Captain Wilson made every effort. He made every effort to try to save the boat. He tried to plug the holes that were created. He tried to throw unnecessary cargo overboard, but he knew how serious it was almost immediately after the accident had happened. So almost as soon as it had happened, he dispatched a lifeboat and with the instructions to get to shore as quickly as you could and spread the news and get help because he knew that the ship would soon be destroyed. And for the folks that were now, the 400 passengers were now in the water trying to survive, that lifeboat getting help was truly their only hope of survival. And finally, just after dawn on Saturday morning, September 8th, that lifeboat did reach shore in Winnetka, Illinois, which is just five miles north of Evanston, Illinois. Now, by this time, Saturday morning, Edward Spencer was out with friends in Evanston enjoying a quiet morning in the town. And Edward was a really sharp guy, but physically he wasn't much to look at. He was really scrawny and described as everyone that knew him as frail. So he was the last person that you would expect to perform any for, sort of you know, feat of strength or endurance. He just didn't seem up for it. But when news of this accident reached Edward and his friends just five miles south, they immediately rushed north to do whatever they could to help without a second thought. And frail as he was, Edward did have one thing going for him, and that was that he had grown up on this Mississippi River, and as a kid and as a young boy, he had taken a special interest in learning how to swim and navigate the water, so his ability to handle himself in the water and swim and dive was outstanding, and that would prove invaluable to him. Because when Edward arrived at Winnetka, people had already begun to gather, but everyone quickly realized that making any attempt at a rescue was going to be near impossible and extremely exhausting. Very, very, very risky. Because apparently there were either no boats in sight, no way to get them to the water where they needed them, or no way to get them through the violent seas, because the only attempted rescue that could even you know, be thought of was that you would simply swim out into the waves, into the breakers, into the currents, and bring survivors back one by one, with nothing more than a rope around your waist held by somebody on land for a little bit of insurance. That was the only hope of making any rescue. And that would have been hard enough on a calm day, but like I said, this was no calm day. There was a storm that had stirred up the water, so there were violent breakers, there were heavy undercurrents that had already claimed the lives of many people. So making even a single rescue in those sorts of conditions was going to be a Herculean effort and be extremely exhausting. And Edward Spencer knew all that. He knew the risks. He understood clearly what was set before him. He knew the current could tire him out, and he would succumb to it and the waves just like many already had. He knew that navigating the water by himself was one thing. Navigating it while dragging somebody else was going to be another story entirely and could end in disaster. And he knew that if he ran into those waves and dove into the waters, that he might not come back. But seeing clearly all the risks involved, Edward Spencer, frail as he was, tied a rope around his waist and ran into the waves. Not once, not twice, not three times. He did that 15 times. 15 times he ran into the waves, fought the currents, fought the breakers, and came back with a passenger from the Lady Elgin who would not have survived if not for his courage. He risked his life each and every time he went out, and he was relentless. During one of his rescues, he was even struck in the head. A wave crashed on him, and, and a piece of the wreckage struck him in the head. And the guy on shore holding his rope saw this happen and saw the blood begin to flow down his face. And so the man on land tried to pull Edward back in. And when Edward felt the rope pulling him back towards the shore, he simply threw the rope off and went on out. And when he got back, he handed his rope to somebody else and went back out again. Fifteen times he did this. Fifteen times. And after those fifteen trips... He was exhausted beyond belief. He had emptied the tank and he had absolutely nothing left. He'd given everything he had. And then, while he was on shore trying to rest, he saw a man clinging to a little bit of wreckage, trying to save himself, and also clinging to and trying to save his wife. And so, with absolutely nothing left, Edward Spencer went back into the waves one more time. This is what the Chicago Tribune wrote about this final effort. Spencer dashed into the waves once, twice, and again, but was washed back by the huge seas. Eventually, he followed a retreating roller. As it passed the two on the frail structure, the man, with his burden in his arms, that being his wife, leaped into the water and made laboriously towards his rescuer. Not a second too soon. An angry roller was at his back. If it reached him, he was lost. The rescuer toiled nobly, they neared one another, 
And just as the outstretched hands met, all was lost in a mighty submerging wave. Its refluence, however, told with a cheer that ran along the shore that they were safe. So by the end of that day, nearly 300 people had lost their lives as a result of this accident. But without the courage of Edward Spencer, you could have added 17 more to that death toll. And that death toll speaks to just how difficult making even a single rescue was. And frail Edward Spencer did it 16 times, saving 17 lives. And he survived every last one of those trips against all odds into the waves. But the consequences of those courageous actions followed him for the rest of his life. By the end of that day, he was exhausted to the point where he was delirious. His brother took him and and got him into bed and tried his best to care for him. And he did a good job of it. But Edward never fully recovered from the physical toll that day took on him. He soon, he had to drop out of seminary and he had to go home. And he relived the rest of his life severely hampered by his poor health and poor physical condition as a result of his actions that Saturday morning. But nearly 40 years later, he was interviewed and he was asked about his actions that day. And the interviewer asked him, he says, do you regret what you did? I mean, considering the price you paid, do you regret what you did? And Spencer said, and I quote, if I had to do it again, I should wish to do on that occasion just what I did. I think it's clear to see that those are the words of a man with great courage. Those are the words of a man who is willing to do the right thing, even if it risked everything. And I know that myself, and I'm sure everybody in this room, would say that I would hope that if I'm ever in a spot like that, I would do the same thing he did. I would hope that if I'm ever in a position like that, I would be willing to risk everything to do the right thing. And maybe that doesn't look like jumping into a freezing cold Lake Michigan like it did for Edward Spencer. But if we can learn anything from this story is that doing the right thing often requires us to risk something. It's not always the safe play. And what I can say without a doubt is we're going to find ourselves in positions like that. We're going to find ourselves in positions where doing the right thing asks us to risk something. And maybe one of these days we might just come into a situation where doing the right thing asks us to risk everything. And when those moments arrive and when they come, we need the virtue of courage to do the right thing. So if we're going to make a habit of making the right choice, courage is just non-negotiable for us. Without courage, there's no hope even for us to be virtuous in any way. There's not even hope for that. Think about it. Just admitting, just simply admitting that you're a Christian and you believe the Bible is not so safe a thing anymore everywhere. Sure, it's safe here, but not safe everywhere. There's some risk involved with that. If you're going to even do simply a good job of disciplining your children, you're going to discipline your children, that requires courage. If you're going to share the gospel with friends and family, that requires courage. If you're going to tell your boss that you're not willing to lie for him, that requires courage. If you're going to pursue justice like Steve talked about last week, that requires courage. If you're going to act wisely like Josiah talked about a couple weeks ago, that requires courage. All of these things require courage on our part. Because if we do any and all of those things, there's a chance that we're going to bear some consequences as a result of it. And so courage, it's a virtue that stands on its own, is important in and of itself. However, it is also the key to putting every other virtue into practice. And if you don't believe me, here's what C.S. Lewis said. He said that courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at its testing point. The form of every virtue at its testing point. That means that this is something that we absolutely cannot afford to lack. We can't do it. And so we're going to look at a story. Edward Spencer's happened 163 years ago. We're going to look at a story today that happened over 2,500 years ago. But yet the courageous actions of the people in the story we're going to look at are still impacting my life and your life today. And I think you'll see how that's true shortly. But before we dig into that, let's look at our first principle. Courage enables us to do the right thing regardless of of the risks. Courage enables us to do the right thing regardless of the risks. Now, our passage, before we dig into it, deserves a needs a little bit of backstory and a little bit of scene setting, okay? So, it involves a couple people by the name of Athaliah and Ahaziah, all right? And it is helpful to know who they were or where they came from. If you're familiar with the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you have probably heard and recognized the names Ahab and Jezebel. Now, Ahab and Jezebel, if you're not familiar, uh, Ahab was the king of Israel, Jezebel was his wife, and they are known for being two of, if not the most wicked people recorded in the Bible. 
They were terrible. They were idol-worshiping, murderous, godless pagans all the way around. They were a dynamic duo that truly made Bonnie and Clyde look like absolute saints. They were terrible. That's their whole claim to fame, all right? That is who Ahab and Jezebel is. Now, Athaliah, who's going to show up in our story, Athaliah is the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. So you've got Ahab and Jezebel, Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Athaliah marries the king of Judah. So this is after Israel and Judah split into two kingdoms. So you've got Ahab and Jezebel, their daughter Athaliah. Athaliah marries the king of Judah. Now, she and the king of Judah, they have a son by the name of Ahaziah. Ahaziah, the son of Athaliah and the king of Judah. All right? Now, eventually, somewhere along the way, the king of Judah, who, which is Athaliah's husband, he dies. So when he dies, Ahaziah, the son of Athaliah, assumes the throne and becomes king of Judah. Now, his reign is extremely short. It lasts for just about a year, and he is killed. But before he's killed, he has a son by the name of Joash. All right? So we've got Ahab and Jezebel all the way down here on this end. Ahab and Jezebel, they have Athaliah. Athaliah and the king of Judah have Ahaziah, and Ahaziah has Joash. Got it? Clear as mud? No problem? <laughs> that took me a week to get my head around. I've been working on that all week. So don't feel too bad if you, you know, don't get it right away. All right? But that's, that's what we're dealing with, all right? Try to, try to remember some of that at least because it's helpful here. So 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 is where we're going to be at, and we're just going to read verse 1 to start with, okay? Now, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she did what any good mother would do. She arose and destroyed all the royal family. <laughs> Wonderful. It doesn't take too long to get a feel for what Athaliah is like, does it? And by the way, what a fantastic Mother's Day Bible story, don't you think? <laughs> This was a real hit. <laughs> Athaliah is murdering the royal family. Woo! But she does, you know, just logically what anybody who wants to assume the throne would do here. Her son, who has, you know, taken the throne from her husband, her son is now dead. And she says, I'm tired of, you know, seeing this from second place. I'm tired of being, you know, second in command or whatever it is. I, I want the throne for myself. And so she decides that the best way to do that is she's just going to kill the entire royal family of Judah so that nobody's left and she'll take the throne for herself. And you really, you know, you can blame her for her actions for sure, but she's just carrying on the family traditions that Ahab and Jezebel set in place. They did a lot of stuff like this. And so she starts wiping out the royal family as fast as she could, one by one, killing all the king's sons. And so if you maybe are a, you know, a student of the Bible and you know this is not just Athaliah wiping out political rivals even. There's a whole lot more at stake than just that. Because if you remember and if you know the messianic line, the line of Jesus himself comes through the royal family of Judah. That's where Jesus' line comes through. So Athaliah, whether she knows it or not, is doing far more than just wiping out political rivals here. She is literally destroying the lineage of Jesus and destroying the messianic line. And if you notice, the passage here says that she arose and destroyed. Those are past tense, which means she is doing a really good job of this. It means that she is really doing a great job of destroying the royal family of Judah because destroyed is past tense, meaning she's got it done. That would be truly earth-shattering news if this was already done. And it sounds like maybe it is. And then comes verse 2. Verse 2 says, But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being put to death. And she put him and his nurse in a bedroom, and thus they hid him from Athaliah, so that he was not put to death. I can't help when I read this but think about Moses' mother hiding him from the Egyptians. It's got the same kind of thing going on. It was Athaliah getting ready to wipe out all the king's sons, and then Jehoshaphat puts herself in harm's way. She summons the courage to go and steal Joash away from this, this you know, group of king's sons that's being put to death, and she hides him, putting herself at risk, because there is absolutely no doubt, no doubt, that if she is found out doing this, she is going to be killed immediately. No doubt about that. No doubt about it. So somehow in the midst of this chaos and this mayhem and the horror of what's going on, Jehoshaphat has the courage to do the right thing, even though it asks her to risk everything for this. 
And she's putting her life on the line here, and I think it's obvious to see that what she did was courageous. But knowing all of that, I've got a question. Do you think that at any point in time throughout all of this that Jehoshaphat might have been afraid? Do you think that it's maybe even possible or probable that Jehoshaphat was fearful in the midst of all this? Even though she's doing something, you know, pretty courageous here, do you think that she was afraid? I think she probably was. The passage doesn't say clearly, so this is not a hundred percenter, but I think it's probably fair to say that she was afraid. She's risking her life. She's defying a murderous queen who will not hesitate to kill her. So I think it's probably fair to say that she was a little afraid, at least at some point, maybe even a lot afraid. So, assuming that she is, does that mean that Jehoshaphat was not courageous because she was afraid? Or, does it mean that Jehoshaphat was courageous precisely because she was afraid, and then she did the right thing anyway, even though she was afraid? I think the answer is pretty clear. It's option B there. Because being afraid does not indicate a lack of courage. That doesn't mean you're not courageous. In fact, being afraid, doing the right thing anyway, is what courage is all about. That's what it's all about. Jehoshaphat was risking everything. I'm sure she was afraid. But we often, we, we misunderstand what courage is and what it's not. We think that we're not courageous or that we cannot be courageous if we're scared. And that's a lie. That's not true. That's not at all the truth. Courage is exactly about being afraid and doing the right thing even though you are afraid. So in those moments where your heart rate spikes and it feels like it's going to come out of your chest and you know what the right thing to do is, but you're afraid to do it, that's when you need courage to go ahead and do the right thing anyway. And if we're going to live virtuous lives, this is something that's not optional. We don't always have the option to avoid risk. Sometimes we have to summon the courage to do that sort of thing. Now, this is not to say that every single time we do the right thing, it's going to require us to risk something. Sometimes it doesn't require us to risk anything at all. Sometimes it's a perfectly safe, op safe option to do the right thing, and that's fantastic. I hope that happens 99% of the time. I wish it happened 100% of the time. You know, that'd be great. But that's not always the way it works out. In fact, it's often not the way it works out. So we need courage to do the right thing despite risks. And this is also not to say that we should go out of our way looking for risky things to do to display our courage. That's also not what this means. Now, I will admit up front that, you know, this is going to be a little bit of a lighthearted example, but I think you'll get the point. But men seem to have a bigger problem with this than women do. We men seem to think that uh, the riskier thing we can come up with to do, that just proves how brave and courageous we are. We think that the risk just proves that we're brave, no matter what we're risking it for. Now, don't equate anybody, men or women, do not equate doing something risky with doing something courageous. Because that is not always a one-to-one -one correlation. Sometimes doing something risky is just dumb. <laughs> Sometimes it is. If you want an example, again, lighthearted example, is that, uh, you know, you can, you can see this play out in a lot of ways, actually, in a lot of places. If you leave men together long enough or you want a man to impress a woman, you can find us doing some of the dumbest stuff you've ever seen. <laughs> we will risk all sorts of stuff just to, you know, be brave, I guess. I don't know. Last July 4th, my brother-in-laws and I, some of them are in the room so they can attest to this story. Uh, my brother-in-laws and I, one of my brother-in-laws got a metric uh, truckload of fireworks. And so we were going to go set them off. And that's good and fine. I wish we would all set off fireworks, you know. And so we went out in the field at my in-law's house. And we were going to, we got big old honking, not little pew-pew, like big, you know. We got those, and so we had mortar tubes, and you set the mortar tubes up, and most people would set one or two of them up and light it, and you know, you get back a little bit, and you let it go off. That's how you do that, right? Well, not us. We screwed 12 of them in a row on a two-by-four, and then screwed a two-by-four to saw horses, so it was easier, you know, you wouldn't have to bend down. And then we had six pallets full of boxes of fireworks right behind us, like I legitimately mean 10 feet apart, six pallets full of boxes that were going off like this. And so what we would do is we'd go down through the line and a couple of them had torches and you'd just and start lighting them and they'd be going off and you'd come over here and light a couple boxes and those are going off and everything's blowing up and it feels like you're in the middle of a war zone because we're standing right here. It's not like we, there was no safe distance. There was none of that. It was just 
And when we would light the mortars, you know, I and a couple others, we'd come along and drop more back in. We'd just reload and go again, you know. And we did that for like 30 to 40 minutes. And it was awesome. It was awesome. I'm going to do it again. It was great. It was fantastic. We put two mortars in one tube, and my brother-in-law said, and I quote, ah, it'll go, and lit it. It did not go. It blew up at ground level in our faces. We were fine. Nobody got hurt, but it shattered the two-by-four. Anyway, so what we did was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Probably a little risky. Was it courageous? No, it was not courageous. We thought we were brave and courageous. Our wives had different opinions. It was fun. It was risky for sure. It was not courageous. So don't equate doing something risky with doing something courageous because sometimes those things do not go together. Courage requires you to risk something because you're doing the right thing, not just because you're risking something for the sake of risking something, all right? So don't get those two confused. Courage is more than just doing risky stuff. So back to the point at hand. When faced with the option to do what is safe or to do what is right, that's when we have courage to do the right thing. And if we're going to make that right choice, courage, again, is not negotiable. As you may have noticed, Jehoshaphat displays this here, but also the story does not end here. You see, she's now rescued Joash, but Joash is all of one year old at this point. And so what do you do with a one-year-old? You've got to hide the one-year-old from the queen who will lop his head off if she gets a chance. So they do just that in First King, or in Second Kings 11 Verse 3, it tells us how long this went on. It says, And he, being Joash, remained with her, Jehoshaphat, for six years, hidden in the house of the Lord, while Athaliah reigned over the land. So for six years, they have to hide Joash from Athaliah. Six years is a long time. And six years is a really long time to keep something like this a secret. And they brought in Jehoshaphat, uh, took Joash and let her husband Jehoiada, who was the high priest at time, in on the secret. And they decided they were going to let a few other people in on the secret to try to help keep Joash hidden. And so they did just that, and that all went perfectly well. But can you imagine living with a secret like this for six years? For six years, you've got to look over your shoulder every day, and you know that with one slip-up, with one screw-up on one person's part, that you are dead. You are dead in the blink of an eye if this gets out. For six years they had to do that. And so what started off as one courageous, heroic act in just a moment's time has now turned into courage, a test of courage in the form of endurance. And did you know that, you know, we often don't think courage and endurance have to do with anything with one another, but did you know that courage used to be known as fortitude? It's not like fortitude or courage, neither one of them are more right than the other for the name of this virtue, but language changes over time. But we used to know it as fortitude. And I think that's helpful because we, we often get our, uh, you know, we think that courage is this thing that we summon in big moments to do heroic things. And that is true. Courage is that. But it is also more than that. And fortitude can kind of help us get our minds around what else courage encompasses. Because fortitude, we often think of fortitude having more to do with endurance, having more to do with kind of enduring over a long period of time. And courage is that too. It's just as necessary and equally as prominent a side of courage. So courage, you need to do the big heroic things. You also need it to endure attacks, to endure hardships, to endure all that stuff over a long period of time. This virtue has two sides, so to speak. It has attack and it has endure. And they are both equally just as big a part of courage and you need both of them. And Jehoshaphat and Jehoiada and all the other people involved display both sides of this absolutely beautifully throughout this story. Because finally, after six years of keeping this a secret, they're going to set Joash on the throne. And to do that, they need a big heroic moment again. And so Jehoiada comes up with a plan, and it's fairly complex, so I'll summarize it, but he comes up with a plan where they're essentially going to bring Joash up into the house of the Lord, and they are going to surround him with guards, they're going to surround him with the help of the Levites, and they're going to gather some people, they're going to set the, the, the uh, crown on his head, and they're going to make him the king. And so they do just that. With the help of the Levites and some of the guards and some other folks, they bring him up, they put the crown on his head, and they begin to celebrate. They anoint him as king, and the rightful king of Judah is sitting on the throne again. And then Athaliah hears and sees what's going on. And when she hears and sees what's going on, she begins to cry out, treason, 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 which is ironic. 
because she killed the whole royal family to get where she's at, which is a lot of treason. So she begins to cry out treason, and really, she was mostly just ignored. Nobody really came to help her, and eventually, she was killed then and there, actually, because she was an evil and wicked queen, and the people were happy to see the rightful king, Joash, sitting on the throne once again. And so all is well in the end, and Jehoshaphat finally gets to see the, the results of her courageous acts six years ago finally pay off in totality. She risked everything in the beginning, and she kept having to risk everything the whole time until this finally pays off here. And I don't know when all this started if she even really knew how high the stakes were. I don't know if she knew that she was saving the last of the Messianic line. I don't know if she knew that the Messianic line was hanging by a thread at this point. I mean, it was one baby, one little boy, one infant away from being cut off and destroyed and wiped out. That's how close it was. I don't know if she knew that or not. But what she did know, she knew what the right thing to do was, and she had the courage to do it, no matter how high the stakes were or not. She knew what the right thing was, and she chose to do it because she had courage. So thanks to Jehoshaphat, the Messianic line survives, and Jesus comes hundreds of years later to fulfill the promise that God made back in Genesis 3 for a Savior to come. And Jesus does, and he fulfills that promise that was sustained through the courage of Jehoshaphat. We would do well to follow her example. We would do well to do the right thing, even if it risks everything, even if that's true. And we don't just need this, once again, for the big heroic stuff. We need this all the time. Like I said, parents who are afraid to discipline their children need courage. Employees who are going to tell the boss that they're not going to fudge numbers, they're not going to admit certain information from the reports, that they're not going to lie, employees who are going to do that sort of thing need courage. You and I, who have friends and family members who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, who need to come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we need courage to speak up, to share the gospel with them. We need the courage to do all of those things. Without it, there's no hope for us to be any sort of virtuous or do any sort of those things. I need courage all the time. And to be honest, right now, I feel like I've got it. I'm pretty fired up about this. But... All the fired up in the world doesn't do me a lot of good or anybody else a lot of good if we don't learn how to develop and how to cultivate courage. And so that leads us to our next principle. Courage is empowered by faith and cultivated in the everyday. Courage is empowered by faith, cultivated in the everyday. We've talked in this series a lot about how all these virtues, these seven virtues that we're talking about, are intertwined. And you can't really totally separate any of them from any of the rest of them. They all kind of, you know, go together. But some of them have a closer relationship than others. Last week you heard Pastor Steve talk about how justice and love are two sides of the same coin and that you can't have one without the other. Well, similarly, this week, you cannot have courage if you do not have faith. They're inseparable. Faith empowers courage. And this is true for anybody who has ever displayed courage over the course of time, they have had some form of faith. Best example of this is that even you can just do this by figuring out things in the world, by looking at the world, but the best example would be that a soldier who is willing to go fight to defend his country and his family. That's courage. And that's courage that's not necessarily based in anything from the Bible. I would say there's biblical principles underneath that. But cultures have been figuring this out for a long time. It's based in just natural revelation that to see that your family and your country or your nation, whatever it is, is worth fighting for. That's a courageous act that's empowered because you believe in something. It's by faith. And while that is a form of faith and courage and a pretty high form of it, it's not quite the pinnacle because the pinnacle of courage, the pinnacle of courage is a Christian who's willing to give his life for faith. That's the pinnacle. A Christian who's willing to give their life for their faith. That is the pinnacle of courage. It's the tip top. And I don't have specific chapter and verse out of Scripture to say, hey, this is where the Bible says that faith empowers courage. It doesn't have a specific chapter and verse, but what it, you can see in Scripture is this principle play out time and time again. You can see it all over the place. For just a couple quick examples, you can look at the Apostle Paul to see this play out. Paul literally spent his life traveling around and preaching the gospel. And did you know that not everywhere Paul went was he welcome? 
He was run out of quite a few places. He put himself in danger quite a few times. In one place, specifically in Lystra, he was nearly stoned to death. In fact, they thought he was dead because he was preaching the gospel. And when he came to, after they left him for dead, you know what he did? He got up, he went to the next town, and he kept preaching, knowing the same thing could happen again. You know how he was able to do that? He was able to do that because he believed what he was preaching. That's why he was able to do that. Stephen did the same thing. Stephen preached the gospel and he was told by the authorities, you have to stop doing that. And he said, I will not. They said, you must stop doing that or we're going to stone you to death. And he said, I cannot stop doing that. And so they did stone him to death. They killed him for it. And he refused to recant of anything he had said or to stop preaching the gospel. Do you know where he had the courage to do that? And why he had the courage to do that? Because he believed and he had faith in what he was preaching. His courage was empowered by his faith. That's why Paul and Stephen and so many others were willing to do what they were willing to do. They were willing to put everything on the line because they had faith that was empowering their courage. So chapter and verse doesn't exist, but the principle is clear. Faith in the right thing empowers us to do the right thing regardless of the risks. That's everywhere. Now the catch with this is that... Any sort of faith or anything that we believe in is not necessarily a basis for courage. Not necessarily. Because there are more than enough examples of people having misguided beliefs and misguided faith in things that ends up leading to their destruction. So just keep in mind that faith in a lie does not make you courageous. It makes you foolish, not courageous. So doing something risky alone is not courageous. And just because you believe in something does not necessarily make it a basis for courage. It needs to be true. Faith in a lie just makes you foolish, not courageous. So don't get caught in that trap. Now the second piece of cultivating and developing courage is this. Practice it every day. Practice it in the small stuff. Practice it in disciplining your children. Practice it in sharing the gospel. Because I'd be willing to bet that Edward Spencer had done courageous things throughout his life before he jumped in the water on September 8th to save all those lives. I would bet that Jehoshaphat had done courageous things all her life. She had chosen to do the right thing, even though it risked something, even if it wasn't a lot. She had made that choice time and time again, long before the moment that we remember her for. Edward Spencer had made the same choice long before the day that we remember him for. And so if we want to be the kind of people who do those sorts of things, we've got to practice this in the little moments. Because generally, as a rule, people who perform these great heroic acts, they don't just wake up one day with the courage to do it. They've built it, they've cultivated it over time because that is how courage works. And we kid ourselves if we think that's not true. If we think that we can just dodge and avoid all the little moments, if we can dodge and avoid disciplining our kids, if we can dodge and avoid and put off you know, telling the boss, no, I'm not going to do that, that's wrong. If we can't find the courage to go to counseling to try to save our marriage, I don't know where we think we're going to find the courage that Jehoshaphat displayed. Doesn't work like that. So here's what we need to do. We must stop avoiding the right thing just because it's risky. We must stop doing that. We've got to cultivate courage by doing the right thing every time, whether it risks a little or a lot. Think about how your family, how your community, how your workplace, how your school, how your church might change if we started to live lives of courage as opposed to always going the safe route. So, we're getting ready to sing a few songs, but what I want you to do is that I'm willing to bet that a lot of you have had something in your head throughout the sermon or something now maybe that's popping up that's like, oh yeah, if I was courageous, I would have done that. Or if I was courageous, I would do this. There's something in your head that's kind of nagging at you. I'd be willing to bet that that's Jesus whispering into your ear. Yeah, that's this thing that you need to do and you know you need to do it, but you're afraid to do it, but you need to do it. I want you to commit right now to say yes to doing whatever that is. And the way I want you to do that, because you probably can't do it right now, is that I want you to grab a pen if you have it or type it in on your phone and somewhere, some way, write down yes. Write it on your hand, write it on your arm, write it in your notebook, type it in on your phone. But carry that with you this week and let that serve as a reminder to you to say yes to what Jesus is asking you to do, regardless of what it asks you to risk. That's what courage will enable us to do. And if we'll live courageous lives, we will hear the most important words we can hear at the end of our lives. You know what those words are? Well done, good and faithful servant.
That's the most important thing we can hear. That's the most important thing we can hear. And if we'll be courageous, we'll never regret it. Because people don't regret courage. They regret cowardice. Edward Spencer didn't regret his courage, even though it cost him a lot. He said, I'd do it again. And we should live our lives in such a way that we can say just what he said. If somebody asks us in 40 years, do you regret it? We should live our lives in a way that we can say, I'd do it the same way again. And that takes courage. So this week, do the right thing. Do the right thing, even if it risks everything. Because doing the right thing is never, ever, ever a mistake, even if it risks everything. Let's stand. Let's sing. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand songs to lift one cry? Then from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ be magnified. Oh, the whole earth echoing His evidence, His name would burst from sea and sky. From rivers to the mountain tops, we hear Christ be magnified. And all oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified. From the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. When every creature finds its inmost melody. And every human heart its native cry. Oh, then in one enraptured hymn of praise, we'll sing Christ be magnified. And oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me, oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified. I won't bow to idols, I stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be formed by feelings, I hold fast to what is true. The cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just the doorway. To resurrection life And if I join you in your suffering Then I'll join you when you rise And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints oh, My heart will still be singing And my soul will be the same Oh, Christ be magnified Let Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified in the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Be magnified.
Father, we come before you and we say that we put our life in, our ha- in your hands and that we trust you. Father, I pray that that is true when we sing that. And I pray that you would help us by the power of your spirit to do the right thing, even when it's hard. Father, we want to be people who make a difference. We want to be people who live virtuous lives. We want to be people who do the right thing. But that's tough and we need your help to do it. So, Father, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would remind us of the truths of your word that can help strengthen us. And I pray that you would strengthen our hearts through your spirit. To share the gospel wherever we go. To refuse to to go along with lies. I pray that we would be people who live courageously and make a difference because of it. Father, help us to do that this week and in every week to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great Mother's Day. And if you are new or recent, I will be right over there.